evermore I will love you, evermore I will serve you, evermore I will glorify the name of the Lord, evermore I'll adore you, evermore bow before you, I will bless your name forever. Good evening, my name is Jenny Fister, and you're probably looking for Greenbrier Almond. Well, Greenbrier is going to be off for the next six weeks, and he's asked me to come and take this time um, to just kind of share with you about um, Scripture, uh, about the Lord, and about taking care of ourselves, uh, taking care of the body, uh, the body of Christ. Um, I'm going to be teaching for the next six weeks out of a book called In Moments Like These. Um, this was a book that I wrote a few years ago. It's a devotional book, and I'm going to be taking six devotions from this book, or maybe a couple of new ones that I'm doing, um, and just share with you my heart, the Lord's heart, and a little bit of, of how we are supposed to take care of the body of Christ. It is a rich, rich opportunity we have to take care of people in this world, both in the kingdom and not in the kingdom. 
It's a rare gift we have of being able to impart peace and mercy and grace into other people's lives. And that's what Brushstroke Ministries is all about. I am president and founder of Brushstroke Ministries, which is a um, threefold ministry of Bible study, worship, and prayer. We go all over the place giving the word out, teaching the word, singing about him, praying for people, and imparting the life-giving presence of God into their lives. I'm also part of a ministry called Breath of God, which meets at the Way of Holiness Church um, in their auxiliary sanctuary at Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock. We are a group of people who just love the Lord. We have no agenda, no need or desire to pull you out of your church. This is an 8 o'clock service. It's a praise service, and it's a contemporary praise service. We rotate people who give the message uh, in and out each week. We give away um, all of the offerings that we take in. We don't keep anything for ourselves. We give 100% of the offering that we receive out every week to other churches, other ministries, other missions, other needs that are in the community. Um, we're going to talk about that later, but right now I just want to do a little teaching uh, called Love at First Hearing. It's one of the earliest things that I wrote a couple years ago, and it's a fascinating story taken from Scripture in the Old Testament about a man named Abraham and his son Isaac. Let me read you the Scripture. It's Genesis chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. So let me set the stage. Abraham was growing old, and his son had not yet found a wife. He was in his mid-30s about this point, and he had not yet found a wife. And so he sends his oldest and most trusted servant, Eliezer, to what Abraham calls his country. He was living in a place that was outside and way beyond where he grew up, where his home was, where his family was, where his, all of his relatives lived. He lived in a place called Canaan, where the Canaanites dwelt, obviously. And they were a people of um, unrighteousness and heathens and he they're actually called pagans where they they serve other gods they don't serve the true god jehovah and abraham in his older years was very worried about his son taking a wife from the canaanites and not a son uh, a wife from where uh, the ones that loved god the same that he did so he sends eliezer to his homeland to find a wife for isaac Abraham wanted only the best for his son. And that best included the best wife that he could get for him that shared the same God, that shared the same morals, that shared the same ideas and shared the same desires and dreams and hopes. The Canaanites did not know this God. They didn't worship him. They didn't honor him. And it would not be suitable for his son to have a wife from um, the Canaanites. So Eliezer travels 500 miles on camel with gifts and jewelry and presents for the family of the wife that he hopes to find for Isaac. 500 miles to the home of Abraham's brother Nahor. And there he finds a remarkable thing. He goes by the well and he prays to the Lord and he says, Father, the woman who comes out and offers to water all of my camels, the one who comes out who selflessly waters my stock before she does hers, let this be the wife that I can choose for Isaac. Let this be the one. So he sits around the well, and out comes this beautiful woman named Rebecca. And what Rebecca does is exactly what God um, has intended for Eliezer's heart to seek after. And that's a woman who is going to put aside her own needs and come and minister to Eliezer. So she does exactly what Eliezer asks. He asks her who her family is, and he comes to find out that she's actually a part of the family of Abraham, not just relatives or people of like mind, but she's actually part of Abraham's family. And so he asks to go home with her, and he goes home, and he tells them of his intentions. Well, Rebecca is 
ready to go. And they trans they give each other gifts and presents. Rebecca is going to be sent back to Abraham and Isaac with um, someone with her and some goods that she has from home, and they're going to go back. So I set this stage because this is a 500-mile journey, 500 journey back to Canaan. So the social amenities have been fulfilled. Rebecca says goodbye to her family. She gets on a camel, and for the next 500 miles, she and Eliezer are going to talk. Now, what do you suppose they're going to talk about for 500 miles? That's like being in a car and going, you know, six, seven hours with someone just in a car. But this is going to take day after day after day. What do you think they're going to talk about? I have an idea. I think if I were a bride-to-be going to meet a husband I'd never met, I would be asking, what does he look like? What is he like? Is he kind-hearted? Um, is he gentle? Is he a hunter? Mm, does he cook? Does he clean? <laughs> does, does he like children? Does he have brothers and sisters? This whole time, she is probably wondering what she's getting herself into. What kind of house does he live in? Is he a cave dweller? Is he, does he have a man cave? <laughs> what, what is he like? Those are the kind of questions that I would be asking. So I figure that for, the, for these 500 miles, Rebecca is just pumping Eliezer with questions. But let's look from Eliezer's point of view. Maybe Eliezer, the prize and chosen servant of Abraham, would rather be talking about himself about how he prayed and how Abraham trusted him to find a son for Isaac, I mean a wife for Isaac, how Abraham entrusted him with goods and gifts, how he went and he asked the right prayer and prayed the right prayer, and isn't he wonderful what a great servant of Abraham that he was? I don't think so. I think really Eliezer spent those 500 miles, those days together, talking about his master. I think Eliezer painted this beautiful picture of who Isaac was for Rebecca. This is important for us because we have a tendency when someone asks us about our master, Jesus, we have a tendency to tell them our story. Which is a great thing because the word says in the book of Revelation that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And so testimony is important. It's powerful. It is a, it a weapon against the enemy. But when it comes to bringing people to Christ, I don't think they're so interested in our story as they are in the master's story. Eliezer spent that whole journey talking about his master. How handsome, how tender, how longing, how grieving he was. Because we're going to find out later that he had just lost his mother and he was grieving and there was a sadness inside of him that nothing else could fill. He was longing for companionship. And I know that Eliezer spent that time telling Rebecca what an amazing husband Isaac was, uh, Isaac was going to make for her. I believe that um, Eliezer spent that time telling her all about the family, all about Isaac's father, Abraham, about how he went to sacrifice Isaac on the altar and God stopped him. I mean, well, that's, that's an important story for a bride-to-be to know that her father-in-law loved God to the point that he was ready to sacrifice his own son on the altar because God asked him to. But also important in that story is the fact that God provided the ram and he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. We know that story that Isaac looked up, uh, Abraham looked up and he saw a ram and they sacrificed the ram. Don't you think that would be an important story to know? Or how about that he had a brother, um, named Ishmael, who um, 
was sort of like a half brother who maybe weren't they weren't on good terms with one another. These are all personal stories that a bride would want to know about an unknown husband, uh, an unknown bridegroom. The Bible says that as they drew closer, they they got back to Canaan and in the field was Isaac. And the Bible says this that he had gone out to meditate in the field toward evening. That speaks a lot about Isaac. That he, waiting for his wife, is not just primping and getting ready. I mean, I'm sure he's looking for every day for them to come back. But what he does is he takes the time, draws away, and meditates in the field to his God, to Jehovah, to the Yahweh. And he saw them coming home. And it says then, Rebekah lifted up her eyes and sprang off the camel. The word sprang means to dismount. Um, the, the, the Hebrew is nepal, uh, to jump off or to leap off um, hastily. It's a hasty descent off of the camel. She didn't just gingerly and carefully kind of slide down like a lady would. I mean, really, if we're women, that's what we would do. We would be very ladylike and sliding off of our camel, making sure that everything looks good. But she did not do that. What she did is she, t- she leapt, literally leapt off the camel into a new life. Literally just jumped off of the camel into a new life. Why? Why, why, why would she do that? I believe it's because in that 500-mile journey, she fell in love with her bridegroom before she even met him, before she even got to see him, before she ever laid eyes on him, she was already in love with him. She was already desiring to be his wife, ready to jump into and to leap into a brand new life with her bridegroom. This literally springs with joy and anticipation. The servant fulfilled the promise to Abraham. Eliezer fulfilled the promise to bring Isaac a wife home from his country, from his people. Yet he accomplished even something far greater than that. He brought a loving bride to a longing bridegroom. He brought a loving bride to a longing bridegroom. It was more than just a completion of an oath. It was more than just Um, a mission. It was a mission of love and grace and bringing together that bride and bridegroom. It had been now three years since Isaac's mother had died. Sarah had died and he had found no comfort. Actually, the Bible says Sarah had died and he had found no comfort for his grieving soul. But Genesis 24, 67 says this, That Isaac, when he saw Rebekah, loved her immediately, and he was comforted in his mother's death. That's what it says. He saw Rebekah, and he was comforted in his mother's death. She not only brought uh, 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 love to him, she brought a restoration together and so that his heart was filled with joy and anticipation and completion. Rebecca provided something that had been sadly lacking. This was the blessing that Eliezer brought. What does this say to us? We are called to be witnesses for our master, for Jesus, going after those who would become his bride. So here's the question. Do we spend more time talking about our story or more time talking about his story? Do we take the time to just tell people about how amazing the bridegroom is? The book of Revelation says that Jesus is our bridegroom and that one day he's coming to get his bride. One day we will be united, we, we will be united with our bridegroom. I don't just want to be a bride. I want to be the one who brings other brides to the bridegroom. One day, we are going to be married. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb that takes place in the book of Revelation. 
I want to be the one who doesn't tell my story. I want to tell his story. I want to tell people about how amazing he is, how loving he is, how gentle he is, how powerful he is, how wise he is, how rich he is. This bridegroom not only owns the cattle, but he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Not only does he love, but he's ready to lay down his own life for his bride. Not only is he giving, but he says, I will never, um, I will always supply your needs according to his riches. This bridegroom will never leave or forsake you. That's what I want to tell people. I don't want to tell them what God, I, I, I do. I want to tell them what God has done in my life. I want to tell them what Jesus has done as my bridegroom. I want to share the relationship that we have together. But that will come after. Those are the stories that come after. What I really want to do is just tell people how amazing this bridegroom is. The Bible says that if he be lifted up, this is John chapter 12, verse 32. If he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. In other words, if we just lift up this bridegroom, he will draw the bride. We don't have to bring the bride home like Eliezer did. We just have to go out and look for the bride, look for the one who needs the bridegroom. There are lost and dying people who need Jesus. Without hope, without um, love, without peace and security. And we need to be those servants who take an oath for a mission of love and grace to bring the bride to a place where the bridegroom will come and get her. That's what John, that John passage says, that if we just lift him up, he will draw all men unto himself. We are to tell his story and not our own. It's not about our journey. It's about his journey. If we would just tell them about the master, they can fall in love with him before they even even meet him, becoming the redeemed bride of Christ. You know, God gives us the awesome privilege of the saving word. That is us. We have the awesome privilege of telling his story, that saving word. It must be the only message on our lips, the only desire of our hearts, and the sole mission of our lives. Charles Wesley, uh, a, a very famous Methodist pastor, wrote a song that says this, A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-ending soul to save, and fit it for the sky. That's how we witness. We have a charge to keep, a God to glorify, a bridegroom to glorify, a never-ending soul to save, never-ending soul after soul after soul to save and fit it for the sky. Fit it so that when we, when we all go home, we all go home together as the bride. That's love at first hearing. You know, there's that adage that says that there's love at first sight, that you have to see before you fall in love, that you have to see it before you um, want to be part of it. But not so. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. We need to be um, telling the story so that it's love at first hearing for this lost and dying world. We need to be speaking about Him, talking about Him, sharing about Him, praising Him, telling them what an amazing God He is. And only then will He be able to draw those people unto Himself. It's an amazing scripture. It's an amazing story with layers and layers and layers of truth and revelation. So this is my, this is my tender care story for today. That if you really care about people and you, you know this bridegroom, we need to get out there and find some more bride. This is, this is how we can take care of this world. It's our responsibility. God gave us and only us the responsibility for this world. Through his power of the Holy Spirit, through the blood of his son Jesus, we have been given sole responsibility to save by speaking his name. We, we know that he does the saving. We know that he does the heart changing. 
but we can set it so when they do hear about the bridegroom that they're already fully and totally in love with him. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this amazing opportunity we have to share. Now, I just want to take a moment to um, talk to you about this book. Actually, what I want to do is to show you, to tell you what God is doing. Brushstroke Ministries is on the move. Uh, God has opened amazing doors for us. And one of the doors is that we are now having four more devotionals published by a publishing company in Florida. Um, they're going to be out by the first, uh, the, the last of May. And these are called In Moments Like These. And what they are are uh, a series of devotions. And the really good thing about this book is that you can adapt it to teach it in a Sunday school class. You could use it as a Bible study, as a sermon, or you can just read it in the quiet, meditative place in your heart with the Lord in your house. Whatever you want to do, you can adapt these. They come with different names, like um, on the sides of the pages, you can look up praise, or you can look up service, or sinfulness, or trials. And then there's a devotion that runs scripture and talks to you about those issues. Three more of them will be strictly devotionals. And there's one book called, In Moments Like These, special days and holidays where we're going to be sharing devotions about everything from Christmas and Easter to April Fool's Day to Mother's Day and Father's Day, 9-11, uh, back to school, where you can use devotions with your children or with your family about these special days. And we're so excited because this is these are going to be brand new hardback bound beautifully um, by this company in, in Florida. I'd also like to take a moment to tell you that Brushstroke Ministries teaches Bible study in the area. We have two Bible studies right now, one on Wednesday nights at the Episcopal Church and one on Friday mornings at, oh, I'm sorry, the Episcopal Church is at 6.30 to 7.30 and then one on Friday morning at First Methodist Church, which is 9.30 to 10.30. We are soon going to be hoping to start one at a third church here in the middle of March. Um, it's for women right now, for women to come. It's we, we have women from all different denominations, all different walks, all different faith, uh, faith places, some mature, some young, some new, some not even in the kingdom. And we all come and we share these Bible studies together. And I'd like to invite any woman who'd be interested to come. Um, if you want to reach us, the number for the ministry is area code 304-642-6301, or you can catch us on uh, the internet. We are our website is brushstrokeministries.com. I also want to invite anybody who would like to come, if you don't have a home church, if you're just looking for a place to worship and praise, to come to the 8 o'clock service. It's called Breath of God, and it's the way at the, we are using the Way of Holiness. We're not part of Way of Holiness. We are using their facility just for the service. We run from 8 to 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and then you are, we, that gives you time to go back to your church for Sunday school or back to your church to worship. It's an amazing group of people that just love God. Um, and so I'd like to invite you to the Breath of God service on Sunday mornings or to one of the Bible studies. If you have a question or we can answer anything for you, just call us or check out the website. There is a contact us page, a place that you can contact us and send an email, and we'll get right back to you. For the next five weeks, six weeks, this one's over, we're going to do uh, five more devotions just to talk about how we can care for each other, care for the world, and also care for our God and for his name. So um, God bless you. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And remember, go be a witness and let someone hear about how great our God is. Good night.